everyone. Over six months ago, we published a video on our mini split AC touting the power efficiency of a mini split unit over a standard RV AC. Since then, we've received many questions and now it's time to add a follow-up video to share the Q&A with everyone. If you have not seen the first video, there will be a link here and in the description. Questions asked and answered cover installation questions such as airflow spacing and cabling. Steve also covers power consumption and efficiency, the heat pump, and would we use it while driving? Drop us any additional questions in the comments below. One of the first questions that I had uh, was really governing around it. What's the, what's the spacing and what's the airflow around the outdoor condensing unit? So this is the condensing unit. It is uh, 30 inches wide, 20 inches high, and about 10 inches deep. Um, it's probably the smallest condensing unit that I could find. The, the recess in my camper is in the driver's side. It is a purpose-built uh, wheel well cover. The uh, interior space inside the wheel well is 34 inches wide um, and it's 24 inches high and, the, and 18 inches deep. And this, this accommodates this condensing unit itself is 30 inches wide and 24, 20 inches high, so it's approximately a two inch spacing all the way around it. And the unit itself is only 10 inches deep, but it's inset two inches into the spacing. So I have a six inch space behind it so that air is brought from underneath of the camper through the backside of the unit and discharged from the propeller fran out the front of the unit. So I effectively, the, the, this two inch air space around the outside is really, is more of a maintenance access. I don't expect, air should not be coming into or, or flow into that area from that space. It should be all coming from beneath uh, because the, as the air is discharged out the front, um, most of the space here is going to be obstructed. The, the flow separation should be achieved by the warm air being rejected out the front, the cool air being drawn in from beneath, and that is, sh should be enough vertical height to allow the warm air to rise and, and, and flow away from the uh, camper as the, the air is continued to be drawn underneath. Um, that is typical in how exterior condensing units work. They keep a, a thermal flow separation by allowing the, the warm air to rise and the cool air to be drawn in from a lower level. This all, there's also was some questions about do I intend to use my air conditioner while I'm traveling and, uh, and the answer to that is definitely no. And, and the reason for that is, is because this is mounted on the side of the vehicle. I believe that the, the slipstream created by the vehicle is going to have a very rapid wall of air flowing at a right angle to the air. Uh, discharge on the condensing unit and there is no way that this fan is going to be able to reject air into that 60 mile an hour slipstream. Um, I think that's pretty common and pretty reasonable. Um, some people place their, their condensing units on the back bumper. <clears throat> that In that place is it in a air shadow of the camper. Uh, I think that some people have talked about, asked me questions about whether or not I, sh they would, uh, I would recommend placing the condensing unit in a manner such that the air from the motion of the vehicle would blow through the uh, condensing unit and, and assist it in cooling. And I, I absolutely think that's a bad idea. And here's my rationale. There's several different reasons. Reason number one is that any rocks or stones that are discharged into the inlet of this camper are going to bend the cooling fins and, and it won't be long before. The second reason I think that trying to operate this unit while in motion and especially if the condensing unit is oriented in the direction of travel is that this fan will become a wind generator. The motor is a, is a brushless DC motor which means that the armature is a permanent magnet. Uh, the stator is what actually drives the motor. The stator is controlled by an electronic circuitry which senses the rotation and, and automatically commutates uh, the electrical signal. Uh, what this all means is that since you have a permanent magnet involved in here, if this fan were to be blown by the wind, it becomes a generator. And as a generator, it's going to feed back electricity into the drive electronics. And while I'm sure that the drive electronics can accommodate some of that, again, because this is made to be a stationary unit set beside a house, it's going to see some occasional windstorms, and that's probably going to happen. But I think that the windstorm created by 65 or 75 miles an hour vehicle travel running into this thing is going to create an extraordinarily high amount of power generation feedback into the drive controller 
and I don't imagine that the drive control is going to survive that. And so I would not orient this unit such that the, the mo air of motion is going to have any uh, effect at blowing through it. Some people have asked about, you know, where and how do you route all your connections? The connections to this device, the main power comes to the device. I'm using a, a 12 gauge uh, cable to supply power to this device. It's far more than is necessary, uh, but uh, not wanting to have voltage drop, I, I opted to, to have the largest cable size. Uh, so the, all power supplied to the unit, and then from this unit, there's a power cable which runs up to the indoor unit that allows it to be turned on and also to signal the compressor to turn on. All of the control section is inside, all of the uh, operation section is outside, so there is a control uh, signal that goes back and forth. There's actually four uh, 14 gauge wires run between the two. Uh, two wires provide power to the indoor unit. One wire is a ground and one wire is a signal wire. And uh, in addition to that, there's also uh, two uh, refrigerant lines, a, a 3 8 copper line and a quarter inch copper line that run into the indoor evaporator. Now one of the other things that's also included here is the indoor evaporator, when it evaporates uh, refrigerant and cools the air, the air condenses moisture so there is a condensate that needs to be drained away. So what I have is all, all my cables go from right in the back corner here in to my, my uh, evaporator which is up above my head. I'll show you that from the inside. Okay, this is your tour of the inside of the, uh, the mini split system. Again, against the wall here we have the, uh, the mini split evaporator coil or the indoor unit as it's also called. Uh, right above it you can see an aluminum box there. That is the ventilation circulator for bringing air from the, the bunk area all the way to the back of the camper to circulate it through the evaporator core. You can see the aluminum duct cover on the right hand side <coughs> and the cabling goes down, it goes underneath the seat and you can see it running along the floor level there all the way down and underneath of the kitchen cabinet. So the kitchen cabinet here is where that large uh, 34 by 24 by 18 inch recess lives. It is underneath of those two drawers and behind those the gray plastic bins there and so that's where the air conditioning unit is. So my, my cable run is pretty short and um, it, I do not have insulation on my copper tubing which is one of the things that I should have but again because it's so short I elected not to do it. The white tube that you can see there is a half inch PEX that is a condensate drain that goes down along with them. Um, it's a, it was pretty simple installation and when that water uh, drains out of that unit it has to get out of the camper so my condensate line ends just right above this wheel well so if it's parked and it's operating then you will have some some puddles of water here beneath the uh, condensing unit which is drainage from the evaporator. One comment I've been asked about it, whether it's possible to cause the the uh, connections to the indoor unit to come out of the left side of the unit and the answer is yes but this is how it works it is essentially there is a space in the bottom of the the indoor unit for all of that cable bundle to be routed across the bottom in the back and then come out the left hand side it does not actually disconnect from the right and reconnect to the left the the condensate drain is still on the right hand side all the cable connections are still on the right hand side it just allows you to run inside the unit to allow the cables to go to the other side um, I knew this when I bought this unit, that uh, this is where it came out. Uh, my door is offset in the back of my camper, so it just so happens that setting it right in the middle of the unit allows me the, the proper conduct path to get, get to where I'm going. So it all worked out well for me. Um, if you have a different configuration, uh, you need to also consider that. One of the other airflow questions you might have is that this draws air in from the top and so I only have a couple inches between well, it was about three inches from the, the top of the unit to the ceiling and about two inches from the top of the unit to my ceiling duct so I don't have all the space that the manufacturer requests when I when I put this in but uh, I don't feel like it's starved for air and it seems to operate just fine with this amount of clearance one of the last things we 
and, and an item of big concern is how much power does this unit use? Uh, how much cooling capacity does it have? How efficient is it? Uh, all of those things. Because this is a, a residential refrigeration unit, it is regulated and required to have a high seasonal efficient energy efficiency rating, uh, which is a 20 a rating of 20 on this, which is pretty high. It's not the highest, but it's pretty high. Um, and the reason for that is that the government mandates uh, energy efficiencies in residential uh, air conditioning systems. They do not mandate efficiencies in, in, in recreational vehicle efficiencies. And, and what you will find is that most recreational uh, air conditioning equipment is not efficient. In most cases, you're either running off a generator, which there's no metering to the power, or you're running off of uh, a grid power in, a, in an RV park, which in most cases you're not paying uh, a metered rate. So as a customer, for that unit, you don't care how much power it uses. Well, if you're running it off a battery, you absolutely care how much energy this thing uses and how much it can provide. So this unit is the smallest unit I could buy. This is a 9,000 BTU cooling capacity. <clears throat> and because this has a variable speed uh, compressor and, a, and an electronic expansion valve, it can vary its cooling capacity anywhere from about 3,000 BTUs up to what's called turbo mode, which is 10 and a half thousand BTUs in cooling mode. So it can, when you first come into the camper, if you have excessive heat in there, you can turn on a, a, a high speed mode, which will run at 120% of compressor capacity for about 30 minutes while it cools the, the unit down, and then it, will, then it will slow down to operate at its normal uh, capacity. But anyway, so this has a, a capacity to run from about 30% to about 120% of its capacity. In heating mode, this actually runs from about 3,000 BTU to about 12,500 BTU. So since the energy consumed by the, uh, actually the energy released in the compressor during the cooling cycle reduces from the cooling capacity because the, 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 that hair heat must be carried away and rejected, it also adds to the heating capacity. So in, in the, the maximum heating capacity is 12,500 BTU, the maximum cooling capacity is 10,500 BTU. So that 1,000 BTU is essentially the, the heat either added to or reduced from the uh, re referential. So we have uh, been, I have a separate power monitor inside for this and it allows me to, to see exactly how much power the unit is drawing at any, any point in time and how much the total accumulation runtime capacity has been. Uh, one of the data points for this is this is rated to draw 732 watts on air conditioning, which is about six, six and a half amps, uh, which is a very low amount of power consumption. Many residential uh, RV units, which are rated at you know 12 to 15,000 BTU, which is again significantly larger than this, are drawn in 12 to 14 amps uh, range. So this is on a on a consumption per unit cooling capacity far more efficient than an RV unit. Um, in the heating capacity, it actually runs a little, a little bit more energy. It runs at uh, 875 watts, so, so about 7 amps is what it, it draws on 120 volt AC when it's running in heating capacity. And, and since we've been using this this fall in, to heat the camper, I think it's, uh, it, it was a very great uh, device to heat the camper. It blows out a lot of warm air. Uh, just to kind of give you an example of, there, there's, a, there's a factor called temperature rise uh, across the evaporator coil in the air conditioning uh, world where you typically want to see about a 20 degree temperature rise across a coil uh, when it's cooling. So that would say it's drawing in 90 degree air and it's going to reject uh, 70 degree air and that represents this 20 degree temperature rise. Uh, in heating mode, um, I did some measurements here a couple days ago that showed that the, outs, the indoor temperature in the, in the camper was about 60 degrees when I was running it. And at 60 degrees indoor air, it was heating that 60 degree air up to 130 degrees. So it had a 70 degree temperature rise, which is pretty phenomenal uh, to being blowing out 130 degree air into a 60 degree camper. That is a very real sense of warmth when that air comes out of there and it is very welcome uh, when it's cooled. One of the other uh, questions that I had was is how, how cool can a heat pump work? So uh, in times past most heat pumps will only work down to about 40 degrees outside air temperature and then they would simply stop working because they didn't have a capacity to move the, the heat from 
and there's not much heat in 40 degree air. This unit is rated to operate in the heating mode all the way down to about 18 degrees Fahrenheit. So uh, substantial capacity for providing heat. Obviously, uh, the lower the temperature goes, the less efficient it is at moving that heat. But in any and all cases, this is always going to be more efficient than a portable electric heater. Uh, with a portable electric heater, you're going to put one unit of energy in. You're going to get one unit of heat out for every unit of energy you put in. Uh, with a heat pump, it's got a it's got a, a leverage factor of this is about 3.6 to one. So every one unit of uh, electric energy that I put into this, it produces 3.6 units of heat, um, and that is at its uh, normal condition as, as air temperature gets colder and colder. I can't tell you exactly what it's going to be, but it's probably not ever going to be worse than about two to one. And so it is always going to be two to four times efficient, more efficient than a portable electric heater to use a heat pump. So if you are contemplating how to operate or survive without propane in the winter, a heat pump is a great way to do it because again it's really your only alternatives in, a, in an RV park you have electricity or propane as your only two sources of heat you don't want to use propane electricity is what's left usually you can't draw enough electricity to heat your your camper using small portable heaters as I just explained they're not very efficient uh, but with a heat pump you can and and it uh, and it works quite well Anyway, I hope that answers the questions that I've been uh, asked. If there are any more, please uh, feel free to comment on my videos. I'll try to provide whatever information I can, um, technical or otherwise. Um, most of you who have actually asked questions have gotten somewhat of a long-winded response. I hope that uh, answered the question. I didn't get any, uh, <laughs> any, any redos. So anyway, thank you for... Uh, for hanging out with me in the shop. Uh, still got lots of projects in the shop. One of the next videos is going to be about, about all the winter modifications that are coming in Maximus. So stay around for that. Thank you very much for, for watching. <laughs>